Ayo, again, again, of course. Ideal media. Cars would be dead without this one. Volkswagen Golf GTI. Basically, the Scirocco is basically a Golf, so it's the same thing. Yay. That's what I have. Yay. Let's see. There's a reason us enthusiasts love a hot hatch. Yeah. They're fun, practical daily drivers that can do almost anything. But there's one hot hatch that started it all. For more than 40 years, it made its name as the only car you'll ever need. A hot hatch so good, Jeremy Clarkson himself chooses it as his daily driver. Even F1 drivers love it. I have a Golf. Not only is it great for going fast and Look at a beautiful hats, car. It can also haul your groceries, your kids, even a big screen TV. And even though its name is the same as the most boring sport ever, there's nothing boring about Baseball? this. But did you know we almost got a GTI with a truck bed? Or that the GTI's front wheel drive is so good, it beat its all wheel drive stablemate in the World Rally Championship. Or that there was an EV option offered way back in 1981. I'm Garrett. And today in Ideal, yeah. I'm dishing all about the grandpappy of hot hatches. So let's kick it into overdrive. I think his eyes are now, you know, a little better. Volkswagen Golf GTI. I appreciate that they upload more now. I think First, it's because of the new guy. Yeah, his eyes are better now. About the Golf and the GTI. Great. The Mark I Golf was launched in 1974 as a follow-up to the Beetle. VW had big changes in mind for their flagship car and ditched their rear engine, rear wheel drive, air-cooled design for a front engine, front wheel drive, water-cooled powertrain. And they mounted the engine transversely. That's sideways in case you didn't know. Like this. Not like this. Like this. Like the Beetle, nothing about the Golf, or the Rabbit as it was first called in the US, screamed performance. It was economical, practical, and kind of boring. So it's a good thing a small Skunk Works team at Volkswagen was secretly trying to make it fast. Their prototypes impressed the higher-ups and they got the green light to unleash the Golf GTI in 1976. Sadly, it was going to be a limited project with only 5,000 planned units. Just enough so VW could enter the Group 1 Touring Car Championship as a pet project. But sales were big. Really big. And by the end of its production run, the Mark 1 Golf had sold nearly 500,000 units. It turns out that Skunk Works team was on It is a beautiful car. You see, prior to the Golf GTI, the car market was divided. There were plain, practical passenger cars and roadsters and sports cars for the niche enthusiast market. The muscle car was dead. Don't at me. That's just because of the 1973 oil crisis. The GTI proved that there was room in the middle of the market for a practical daily driver that was also fun as heck to drive fast. Are you glad we've got a GR Corolla hot hatch today? Thank the GTI. And so the GTI was cemented as a mainstay in the VW lineup and the car evolved with the times. Let's speed through the generations. The OG Mark I GTI ran from 1976 to 1983. The Mark II GTI released in 1985 and was a big step up. Its 1.8 liter engine could top out at 140 miles per. The Mark III was bigger still and the first generation Golf to get the VR6 engine option. The Mark IV Golf and GTI had a ton of- So, uh, my first car was the Seat Leon, the first gen, which is based on the Golf 4 platform incredible cars i had so much fun driving that car i still miss you know it, it, it's like your first car even though that engine was totally shot this uh, three out of the four cylinder was working uh i paid 700 bucks for it and it was not fun at all to drive it was my first car and i still love it if if only you know i didn't make dumb decisions to just scrap the the, the entire car then i would have kept it most definitely and uh, build it better, probably put a 1.4 turbo in it, I mean 1.8 turbo, like in the GTI model, which would have been a whole lot of fun with that car, I don't know, It even though it it took like 20 seconds for it to hit like 50 miles an hour, you know, it, it was still fun, even though it was so slow and broken of engine options from turbocharged four bangers naturally aspirated five cylinders and the 3.2 liter vr6 powered golf r32 which also had four wheel drive and was the highest performance level golf to date the mark 5 golf also had its own r32 edition guess what after i traded in my first gen seat leon for a second gen seat leon which i you know i changed i i basically got bottom tier dollar of it nothing from it basically chump change you no know, scrap metal change 
And the second gen, I had a 2 liter non-turbo one. There was a turbo one available, but I was like, no. I, people have said that the turbo, turbo ones were bad and stuff, you know, like uh, a whole lot of problems. I was like, yeah, let's not go for the turbo. Looking back at it now, it's like, I love turbo cars, bro. Turbo cars are lit. I should have maybe just said, screw it and gone for the turbo charge one because the uh, non-turbo version only lasted me about a year still it made a uh, you know it made power it was fun it was fast it did sip a whole lot of gas though so that was not fun a whole lot of petrol not fun that aspect but it was fast i could race it around every day it was a really nice car alongside the gti the sixth generation golf and gti had the best looks yet and the Ah, the 6th generation, guess what? The Scirocco Mark III, based on this car. I love this car. It's a 1.4 turbo, it's efficient, it's, you know, I can drive, drive and drive and drive. Mine is a little bit custom, customized, it's super nice. I love every second of it, but I do wish it was faster. Like, today I was driving it, I went outside because, like, once every two weeks I have to, you know, have to drive it, for me, for my sake. Also, also, always... Uh, put some air in the tires just to make sure they don't flat spot and all that so yeah I drove it and it was like stuttering so much when I try, like put the f power to the floor you know when I uh, hit the gas it was just stuttering 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 and not doing anything so I do wish I would have had a 2 liter turbo even though in this economy with my, the gas prices and the efficiency this car is incredible but like I would like a 2 liter turbo charged one is like all you need basically but then again i wouldn't have a manual option and i do love my manual cars still incredibly fun and beautiful like looking at the car is always like oh it's so nice so so nice the r32 simply became the golf r the mark 7 got another facelift and started off trouble but got way better across the generation <sighs> And I should also mention, across its long history, the Golf has been gas-powered, diesel-powered, naturally aspirated, supercharged, turbocharged, and there's been displacement numbers all over the map. And it's still impressive today with the Mark 8 GTI, the angriest looking Golf yet. So, now that we're all caught up, it's time for 10 things you didn't know about the Volkswagen Golf. Apparently, the Golf isn't actually named after the sport. It's named for the Gulfstream winds. In uh -huh. fact, a bunch of VWs are named after wind. Uh -huh. Jetta is German for jet stream, Passat is German for trade winds, and the Sirocco is named for the winds of the Mediterranean. Yep. So, I guess Phaeton is German for breaking wind? Ah. Forget the Tesla Model S. The original plaid car was the Golf GTI. Interior yeah. designer... Plaid interior, oh yeah. Gunhild Liljequist. I'm not the biggest fan of the plaid. Like golf ball and plaid seats as an homage to Scotland, where golf was invented. You can still find the Scottish plaid and dimples in GTIs to this day. The Mark IV was the first golf to carry the R badge with its <laughs> high performance VR6 and four wheel drive, but the original Golf R was the Golf Rally, or Raul Ye. Like Kanye? I don't know. Released in 1989, it was a supercharged all wheel drive performance golf built for competition and rally. Sadly, it performed even worse than the front wheel drive GTI and never earned a single win. But that didn't stop it from becoming a collector's item today. The golf platform has been made into a hatch, a wagon, a sedan in the form of the Jetta, and a convertible. But the most interesting golf ever is the VW Rabbit pickup, also known as the VW Caddy. Again with these sport references. It's basically a two-seater Mark I Golf with a truck bed. The VW Rabbit pickup sold from 1979 to 1983 with about 75,000 units sold and they almost built them in GTI trim, but they opted for a diesel instead. Rally was big in the 90s and VW wanted in. So a prototype rally-ready Mark III Golf was made codenamed the A59. It was a 275 horsepower beast designed to compete with the likes of the blue and gold Subaru Impreza WRC. It had a big old Garrett turbo. Hey, that's me! Plus, wide body fenders and body panels made of carbon fiber and freaking Kevlar. 
You know, the stuff that makes you bulletproof? Sadly, VW entered a financial downswing and the A59 never made it past the prototype stage. Also, shouts out to the GTI W12 650, a prototype powered by a six liter Bentley W12 engine mounted in the rear with a Lamborghini subframe to handle all that weight and power. It's probably the only 650 horsepower Golf VW ever produced. The first EV Golf we got here in the US was the Mark 7 e-Golf in 2015, but Volkswagen was running Golfs on batteries way before that. In the 70s and 80s, Volkswagen partnered with German utility company RWE to build about 200 battery-powered Golfs across the first three generations. These city stormer Golfs could put down about 30 horsepower from their front wheel mounted electric motors and only had a range of like 60 miles. There are about 50 of them on the road still today. One of the only reasons the original GTI was produced was so VW could enter the Group 1 Touring Car Championships. 40 years later, they've sold over 2 million GTIs and won a pair of TCR International Series Championships in 2016 and 2017. And VW released a special TCR GTI edition in Europe to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, VW killed all their motorsport programs in 2020, but that doesn't mean you can't take your GTI out for track duty. From 1978 to 1987, Volkswagen manufactured over a million Golfs and Jettas right here in the US of A. The Westmoreland assembly plant of Pennsylvania was originally gonna produce Chryslers, but Chrysler backed out in the last minute, allowing VW to step in. It marked the first time a foreign automaker had produced vehicles in the US since Rolls-Royce way back in the 20s. I say, Jim, put down that bootleg martini and help me get this aeroplane engine into this saloon car. If you've been an enthusiast for long enough, you've probably Harlequin, seen a Harlequin yeah. build somewhere on the internet. But did you know Volkswagen was the OG of this multicolored movement? Of course. In 1996, VW released 264 Harlequin Golfs for the US market. Each car was completely manufactured in one single factory color. After they were done, workers would swap out all the body panels by hand. That's a lot of work, but at least it's better than all the boring black, white, and silver cars we get these days. Now, I think they're cool, but I got a question for you. Would you drive one of these things? Yeah. Let me know down in the comments. The Mark... My, uh... Coworker or the TU, the TU has a Harlequin. I don't know if it was a Polo or a Golf, but he has a Harlequin on bags, bro. That 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 one goes hard. Like he has spent tons of money on that car. So nice in the pictures. I haven't seen it because he doesn't take it out of the garage. But it's uh yeah, super nice car. Everything custom made by him as well. You know all the tubes, all the day, all the stuff, like. Yeah, a super nice car. Beautiful. Mark IV Golf R32 was the first ever direct shift gearbox production BSC, car. Yep. And of course, we didn't get that option here in the US. But if you didn't know, DSG is basically VW's own style of dual clutch transmission. And mm -hmm. if you still don't know what I'm talking about, it's a manual transmission with two automated clutches that, uh, you know what? I'll just get trapped to do a launch control on this. For now, just think paddle shifters. The advantage is DSG shifts faster than a traditional stick shift, but be warned, if something goes wrong with the DSG in your Golf R, it ain't cheap to fix because these things are complicated. Yeah, but the, and the and DSG honestly, took over, as an bro. Enthusiast, wouldn't you prefer the feel of a dimpled shifter in your palm over those? I have the same steering. If the answer is so yes, nice. get yourself one of these ideal Save the Manuals t-shirts. Just follow the link down in the description below to pick up yours today. And now it's time for what is the ideal GTI. The sponsored seven. by Ideal Car Strategies. The and seven is the already, ideal one. Click the link down in the description to check out our it's free workshop. It's the most well-rounded on one, luxury or tech. Any other ideal car. So that's what you the want. Best GTI to get. Now I'm going with the 2019 GTI Rabbit Edition. This thing is basically the best of the Mark 7 generation. It's two liter turbocharged MI4, yep. puts down 228 horsepower, and more importantly, 258 pound feet of torque. There's even an electronically controlled LSD so you can grip and rip through the corners, and you get the classic plaid seats. With a simple tune, like plaid pipe, and a few other small mods, you're in the neighborhood of nearly 400 horsepower. Uh -huh. And you get all of that for just a hair under 23K. 23K? This thing is a future collector's item. Now, if that's not in the budget, take a look at a Mark IV with a VR6. Yep. They're cheap, still fun or to drive, Or a 1.8 turbo. Amazing. Incredible cars, just incredible engines. This. 
Well, there you have it. All things GTI. Do you That was nice. I do love the GTI, the Golfs, the Volkswagens. I'm looking, you know, always looking for the next car to buy and stuff to do and things to do. Uh, yeah, the uh, Sierra Leone third generation looks beautiful, especially in the station wagon aspect. It looks beautiful. Uh, the like super trim model, like the SC240 or whatever they call it. It looks so nice. I would like that one. But I probably won't get rid of this Scirocco unless I have a like super deal. Like someone wants to pay me like, you know, a good amount of money for it. Then I'm just like, okay, yeah, sure. Like I got this one for like cheap, cheap. That's why I want, I'm like, I, I will never, I will probably never find a car as good as this one, as nice as this one for as cheap as this one. You know, it's, it's right. It's right outside there. That's why I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to get rid of it because it's just, you know, for the money I paid for it, there's nothing else even close to this one. So I have to either go up or just keep it forever. Which I, I probably won't unless like the engine blows up and I make money off of YouTube and put a new engine in it. That would be nice. If you want to see that, please give me one. Bye.